Hello, everybody. Good morning. Grüß Gott. Uh, so my name is Piotr Schlanta. I'm head of the Scientific Center of the Polish Academy of Sciences uh, in, in Vienna. And today my guest is uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Kamil Urszała, historian, uh, Aston professor of modern history at the Gielonian University, uh, who study in, in, in Krakow, Vienna and Prague. Uh, currently, he's a fellow at the Institute for uh, the Wissenschaften von mentions uh, in English Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He specializes in the history of the First World War uh, and generally Austro-Hungary and East Central uh, Europe uh, in the 19 and the 20 um, history with the particular focus on, on the uh, Galicia World War uh, One and the collapse of the Habsburg uh, Empire. In 2020, he published a book, Galician Exodus Refugees During the First World War in the Habsburg. Uh, Monarchy. This was published uh, in Polish in, in Krakow, but I hope it will it, it will be uh, translated into English or or German uh, um, soon. Now, Dr. Rushawa realizes his uh, uh, fellowship found sponsored by National Scientific Center about refugee camps um, ca refugee camps uh, during the First War uh, uh, War. So, hello, Camille. Uh, so maybe uh, let's let's talk our our discussion uh, about the refugee phenomenon during the First World War with um, kind of the personal question: Why did you decide a couple of years ago to 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 to, to study uh, refugees uh, experience during the First World War? What what were the reasons? So I can guess that one of the first that you came from 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 from, from the former Galicia. From the southeastern uh, Poland, maybe it's a part of of your uh, family history. But anyway, what was the reason? So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Piotr, for uh, introduction and also for inviting me to this discussion. So uh, firstly, I must confess that really the history of Galicia is something which fascinates me since I was a child because of the military cemeteries from the time of the First World War, which were dislocated in different part of the. Małopolska, Lesser Poland, so uh, south eastern part of Poland, and also Podkarpatia region, so actually the region where I came from. And uh, during my study, I started to discover some new field of research when it comes to the First World War, and I found out the subject about the refugees, a totally forgotten subject in the historiography, in the Polish historiography, but also it's not only the Polish history, because we are talking about the multicultural society about the Poles, Ruthenians, Ukrainians, uh, Jews, also Germans who found themselves, the evacu who were evacuated, who, who found themselves somewhere in a different part of the Habsburg monarchy. So that was the first, let's say, factor that this subject was totally forgotten in the historiography and uh, something which really need to be, let's say, rediscovered by historians and also to bring, and also that was one of the main, my aim to bring back this to the public uh, consciousness, public discourse about this experience of the First World War. We have to remember that the, generally speaking, the experience of the First World War is totally overshadowed by the experience of the Second World War, especially in the Polish context and especially in East Central Europe. So that's why also my particular focus on the First World War uh, found some, let's say, some special interest. Uh, another stuff is that we are talking about the some history, which was actually the big history, because we are talking about the humans on move in the time of the First World War, uh, which was not only in Galicia, which was actually the whole Europe. So we are talking about the quite big movement but this movement, which was connected with the, some average person who lived in Galicia at that time. So that's why we have to remember. So we have to remember that that was actually the history of the Galician inhabitants in that time about the, about their experience in the time of the First World War, about the forced evacuation, forced migration, uh, how, uh, sorry, how they just uh, lived on the refugee in the time of the First World War. So this is what we are also going to discuss a bit later, I think. So, um, if you don't mind, Camille, could you please explain explain our English-speaking audience uh, who are maybe not a specialist in the history of our 
part of, of Europe. Why um, this uh, experience of the First World War was overshadowed uh, by the experience of the Second World War? That that was my first question, connection to to, to your to your answer and to your presentation. And uh, another, from for what reason for, for what reason historians. Um, uh, were not interested in, in researching uh, this experience of the refugee dom or, or more broadly speaking, uh, the social issue of the First War. Uh, war. How to explain that? Mm -hmm. I think we could just combine those two questions and to provide some one answer. So firstly, we have to remember that especially after the First World War, in the time when the, let's say, the whole Europe was, was let's say, re restored after the First World War in these post-imperial realities, we are talking about uh, some, let's say, different national histories. And also this is the case of the Poland. Even that Poland was not like the one national state after the First World War, they have to find some one narration in order just to, let's say, combine to unify the Polish statehood after the 1918. So that's why everything was about the, in the time of the Second Republic of Poland, everything was about the legacies of the myth which established the Second Republic of Poland, which means the Józef Piłsudski and its legion. So we have to remember that that was, let's say, the one of the mainstream. At the same time, the mainstream was about the military issue and that's why also the elements about the civil experience like refugee dome including refugee dome was totally overshadowed and even forgotten experience in this context so just if we would like so say let's say very generally so mm -hmm. uh, about this i think that the exile and refugee dome was not so i would say attractive as a Piłsudski's legion as a Polish legion as a military issue after the time of the First World War. Okay, so I, I agree with that. I, I suppose it was the same, for example, in Czechoslovakia, Serbia uh, as, as well. So this history of the fighting for the independence or for the unification of the brothers um, uh, which lived before 1914 Hungary uh, with the national state uh, that dominates um, uh, the political uh, dispute during during the war it, it also helped to to, to legitimize a, a different different uh, government uh, uh, as well and the attraction of the of the second world war were of course on a comparison bigger for for the for the whole region so that that, that, that that's why according to to me uh, so Nobody expect in the, in the in the summer 1914 when the war broke out. Nobody, nobody expected, or at least very few, that this uh, war could last more than a few uh, a few weeks. But uh, it turned out that this this war um, uh, prolonged into into four year very bloody, um, uh, depriving the human material financial resolve um, conflict. Could you please name the reasons why the people in the summer 1914 decided to, to, to rush into the internal provinces of Habsburg uh, monarchy? Uh, was it only fear of the, of the Russian atrocities? We, we feel that really at the beginning of the First World War, people actually had no idea what the war really meant. So that was some one of the, I mean, about the average inhabitants of the Galicia at that time. So firstly, they started to discuss those who were, let's say, from the intellectual society, they started to discuss in the especially different coffee houses in Lviv or in Krakow or in some other uh, bigger cities or towns in Galicia, what the war really bring to this, uh, to, to the reality of this of the society in Galicia at that time. But as a matter of fact, no one had idea what the war really meant. And that's why also they were, people were just scared because of the information which came with, together, for example, with the newspapers about the Russian atrocities in the eastern part of the Galicia. Then refugees started to uh, move from the eastern part of Galicia toward western part of Galicia, and they also provide some uh, a dozen or more stories about the realities under the Russian occupation, under the Russian regime in their home site. So this is one that was one of the factors. So panic, uh, that was the fear uh, connected with the Russian as a, uh, with the Russian enemies, 
with the Russian army and their activity in the eastern part of the Galicia region. Uh, we have to remember that also those, let's say, spontaneous evacuation, because in this case we are talking about the, some spontaneous flight, spontaneous, spontaneous escape, was accompanied with the evacuation which was provided by the Austrian state, which was connected especially with the biggest cities in Galicia, like Lviv, Lemberg, Lvov, the capital, of course, and also those two which were connected with the military, let's say, defense system in the Habsburg monarchy. So I am thinking about the uh, Przemysl, uh, which was one of the fortress. And the second one, of course, Krakow, which also played quite important role as the, let's say, some form of the vital backdrop for the theater of the future war in Galicia. So uh, we have to remember that those, let's say, two experiences, so together, uh, the forced evacuation, uh, together with the uh, spontaneous escape and the flight from, from the home site of the inhabitants of Galicia, those were connected with the one story, which means the refugee dome in the time of the First World War. What are the numbers? Uh, I, I, I exactly know that it's not easy just to, 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 to count, it's impossible just to count uh, refugees, but that we historians should at least try to, to estimate the, the, the scale of this uh, phenomenon. So could you, could you say something mm -hmm. about we're looking for, um, for, for uh, freedom, looking for safety, first of all, um, beyond the Galician borders? Mm -hmm. This is a very important question, but as this important question is, we have to remember that it's very hard to answer on this question in one wo in one, one wo voice, just to say in one word or one sentence how many inhabitants left Galicia uh, in, during the time of the First World War and who uh, among them were uh, classified as refugees. But I will try to explain more or less how um, how we could try to estimate these numbers. So first, we have to remember remember that there were a couple of some trajectories, I would say, of the, or even waves of refugees, internal uh, refugees within the Habsburg Empire. The first one was from the beginning of the war, 1914. So September, November, September, October, November, 1914. Then we have the next connected with the, some internal military movement within Galicia at the beginning of the 1915. And then Finally, the, to the, big, the, the next one, not the biggest one in the scale, but also quite important waves of refugees after the Rusilov offensive and after Kerensky's offensive, so Rusilov in the 1916 and then Kerensky's in 19, October 1917, which was the, actually the last one wave of the uh, wave of refugees. So we could estimate more or less uh, according to official numbers that at the beginning, at the end of the uh, 1914, beginning of the 1950, we could find about half millions of refugee, refugees from Galicia within the Habsburg monarchy. Then, of course, we have to remember that after May 1915, we are talking about the starting a new military front with Italy. So to, to, together with the Galician refugees, we could find refugee camps or displaced within the Habsburg monarchy refugees, for example, uh, from I mean, Italian refugees, uh, Slovenian refugees, Croatian refugees, and so on and so forth, uh, displaced it within, within the Habsburg monarchy uh, together with Galicia. So then the, we have the, even the bigger and bigger numbers of the evacuated or just people who fled, who, is, who escaped from their home sites. So uh, in the, let's say, the, one of the highest peak, one of the estimation, official estimation, just mentioned about the one million people within the Habsburg Empire, but this is still what we have to discuss because the number uh, we have to dis this is what we have to discover as a historians the precise number because we have to remember that those all of the waves of refugees were very dynamic some of them returned to, the, to their home site then we have the new waves of refugees so this number is very i would say fluctual and it's really hard to say uh, especially that we don't have such a precise statistic about the people who left their home site, especially from the time of the 1914, when the evacuation was organized because everything was provided in a hurry by an Austrian state. So it means there were no space actually to provide some precise numbers or precise uh, data to just to say in one, one sentence how many refugees uh, left Galicia. 
So I, I, I was wonder um, about the different uh, experience of being a refuge uh, uh, by the people coming from the different social st um, status. Uh, oh, you already yeah. mentioned that, that that the wealthy Galician could just buy a ticket and just move to the Vienna, um, rent an apartment, and, and and live in this in uh, in this city. So they were never yes, uh, yes, never yes. registered. But um, well, what is important, what seems important to me, uh, and um, it's the reaction of the what seem, seems what seems interested at least to me it's the reaction of the uh, austrian uh, authorities on this unexpected wave of the desperate people who just try to to get into uh, into the internal provinces of the habsburg monarchy when we can um, uh, talk about the um, official uh, policy of the of the austrian uh, states uh, uh, to these uh, refugees and how they try to manage this uh, this huge crisis because these people mm -hmm. uh, have to had to eat something they should be deliver a, a, a flat place a pl place to live it was a huge internal crisis in the first two years of the uh, of the wars so um Firstly, that's, that was very visible that the society of Galicia was very different. So we could say about the people who uh, could afford to rent some flat in Vienna or in Prague or in Olomouc, uh, uh, Pardubice or anywhere within the internal part of the Habsburg monarchy. So it means they could just uh, they could just stay there on their own expenses. But of course, we are talking also about the second sector so among the, uh, uh, about the people who uh, were just forced evacuated and who found themselves for example in refugee camps so this is also connected with this policy of the evacuate this is also connected with the austrian policy towards refugees how they uh, just uh, try to cope with such a let's say internal crisis migration crisis refugee crisis so they organized some firstly some two different categories of location of refugees firstly that was refugee states refugee camps which were uh, deliberately provided organized by the austrian authorities that was a dozen or more refugee camps especially in the territories of the Mora uh, Moravia, Czech, Bohemia, uh, Lower Austria, uh, in, with some, let's say, particular examples in Stevia or Carinthia, or for example, also in the Salzburg region or in the uh, Upper Austria, not really in the Alp region, so not really in the Vorarlberg on Tyrol because of the also geographical dimension and lack, some lack of space. So that was the first category, refugee camps provided by Austrian state just to host refugees. And the second category that was some giving some special status of cities, municipalities, towns, uh, or even villages within the Austrian part of the monarchy, because we have to also remember that Galicians were inhabitants of Austria. So they were, even that some of them just crossed the uh, mountains and found themselves in Hungarian part of the monarchy, they stay they still were treated as an Austrian uh, Austrian citizens and then even forced expelled to the Austrian part of the monarchy. Uh, so uh, different municipalities received the, some special status of the some, uh, let's say the in German was what was called Flucklings und der Bingungsgemeinde. So some special, let's say, uh, municipalities which were allowed to host refugees. That was also uh, uh, some form of, let's say, the, some policy of controlling the society and the move of the, some policy of, let's say, the uh, displaced the, the displaced society. So it means, for example, if the Olomouc or if Brno or some other city town in Galicia, uh, in Austrian part of the monarchy in Austria-Hungary, received the status of being this municipality to hosting refugees. It means that refugee need to stay in this particular particular place. If this city municipality lost this status, it means that refugees had to find some other place just to to find some shelter in some other place. Uh, also, mm -hmm. let's say being on the list in the uh, in the Austrian administration. Okay, but who care uh, about about the refugees who deliver them food, medicine, 
clouds uh, were there uh, welcomed by uh, ad, ad subjects, ad, other subjects of Franz Joseph the, the, the first uh, with the open hands, or uh, there were some animosities uh, between Galician refugees and, and, and the people in the upper Austria uh, for, 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 for whom they uh, should be quite exotical, I, I, quite oriental. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was mm -hmm. the so, everyday relation between the people deprived of their own home yeah. and and the so host communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So firstly, uh, they really received some form of support uh, from, a, let's say, the different uh, from a different sources. One of the sources was, uh, of course, the Austrian official sources. So it means that especially uh, in the 1950, 1960, some special infrastructure was organized just to deliver uh, clothes for refugees. Another, uh, another history is connected with some self-organizing, some form of the solidarity, which was very visible among uh, refugees on exile. So it means they organized a lot of the committees mm -hmm. just to help refugees within uh, Austria, uh, Austria, uh, Hungary, especially in the Austrian part of the monarchy in Hungary, we have also such a committee, but that was some exception. Then we are going to the, the next sector, which is, uh, let's say, the next section, which is connected with some refugees and, um, and locals and in, local inhabitants. So refugees from Galicia who found themselves within the Habsburg Empire on refugee camps or out beyond the refugee camps were, of course, visible, were visible by the local uh, inhabitants within the uh, Austrian part of the monarchy and also Hungarian part of the monarchy. And also this provided some differences. People started to observe refugees, Poles, Ukrainians, Ukrainians, uh, Jews who looked a bit differently, had another customs, they were unable to understand their language. But as a matter of fact, it was not only about some cultural differences and cultural dimension mm -hmm. that was connected also with some element, let's say the lack of the uh, not uh, lack of the mobility before the First World War, so it means there were no reasons that refugees could, for example, uh, travel from Galicia to the Tyrol, to the Lower Austria, Upper Austria, and of course it went also in the two directions, which also provided the First World War from this, let's say, cultural perspective as the first, and I would say also the last meeting of the inhabitants of the same monarchy. So this is one of the theses from my book, that those society met, let's say, even I would say on the funeral of the day monarchy in the time of the First World War. But as a matter of fact, we have to remember we are talking about the war, we have to, we are talking about the crisis, and crisis provided that people became very anxious, very nervous, and it also provided some tensions between the locals and refugees, because refugees were treated as a, not only outsiders, I would say even if even uh, even uh, alien, I would say, no? even alien, even that they were the same inhabitants of the same monarchy, but they were just, let's say, treated as some treat, for example, as a competitors in the everyday lives. They were treated, for example, as a competitors for a food, especially in the 1960, 1970 time of the war crisis, competitors for, let's say, uh, not only for the food, but also, for example, for the flats, when the press within Austria and Austria-Hungary just wrote every, uh, almost every single day about so-called Wohnungsnot, so needs for a flat. And of course, who were responsible for this situation? War migrants, war refugees. So this is also how we have to understand that uh, the, from this, let's say, cultural differences are very mixed with the tensions which were which were just caused by the first world war and the crisis mm -hmm. so it's, it it seems to me that the, the this the first world war in this refugee experience this mass migration mass forced migration from galicia into the internal provinces of the habsburg monarchy deepened the national divisions uh, of, of that country and to the same to the to the some degree, so prepare the fall of, of, of that. It was, as you mentioned, the first meeting of the different nation uh, inhabited this Habsburg monarchy on on, on, on that on that uh, scale. So there was no solidarity, solidarity, and the compassion was not the you know, the, 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 the pr providing 
um, emotions among among the, these uh, uh, local local uh, populace, uh, which were burdened to to, to host uh, refugees mm -hmm. from from Galicia. So it was kind mm -hmm. of the cross for them. That was kind of a, a burden. I would say. I would a, a say. Yeah, I would say even that was some form of the in-depth ethnicization of the monarchy. We know that everything was categorized by the, let's say, ethnicity and the nationality. We have to remember that refugee camps were organized by the, let's say, national religious key. Then we have also Why? the self-organized like committees. That's Yes, that's an interesting question. As an official, as a, let's say, official interpretation, when the instruction about the hosting refugees were organized, the official interpretation was that the, by such a location, by the using the national religious key, the refugees could fill this Heimatsgefühl, so some, let's say, connections with their the home country, not missing of the home country, living in the same community. In my interpretation, that was, let's say, two different factors. So first factor most, most mostly connected with the economical situation. We have to remember, we are talking about the multicultural and multi, let's say, confessional society. So it means when we are talking about the refugee camps constructed for Poles, it means that only Roman Catholic Church and Polish school need to be organized in the refugee camp. If we are talking about the one refugee camp where we could have Poles, Jews and Ukrainians, it's not only about some, let's say, multinational tensions within such a very limited space, but it means that Austrian state should provide the Roman Catholic Church, Greek Catholic Church, and also the Jewish temple, then provided three different schooling system, even providing some different food system. So this is, I think, mostly connected with the economical reason. And the second one, I would say this categorization was also connected with some form of the controlling the society. Because as we know from the, from the beginning of the First World War and also what is very visible in the sources before the First World War, that was a mass suspicious in, connect, uh, in connection, let's say, in direction to the Ruthenians who lived in Galicia, especially because of some of the because of the fact that some of them were uh, Moscovites, so it means that they were Ru uh, Russian-oriented when it comes by the by the religious, and in the next step by the political way of thinking. So it means that also in the 1914 and the 1915, the refugee camps for the, for example, Ruthenians were controlled on some, let's say, special level, contrary, for example, the refugee camps for Poles or for uh, Jews. That's why also some special camps, which was not refugee camps, as a matter of fact, but the internment camps in Palerhof, next to Graz, in Styria, was organized, which was a place for Ruthenians from Galicia, as, uh, who were treated as a suspicious element of the, uh, of the monarchy. Mm -hmm. But the um, people who were uh, forced to, to live in this, uh, in Talerhof, a camp were just deported from 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 from, from Galicia, but military uh, authorities with suspicion of being of uh, harboring some pro-Russian uh, pro-Russian sentiments or, or, or willingness to, to to help Russian in in the uh, invasion. But um, you mentioned about or already um, a lot ab about the uh, this refugee camp. Could you describe an everyday uh, how everyday lives look in? In such, in such camp, these people mm -hmm. were allowed to to, to work, uh, but I, I, I can imagine that there was huge boredom in, in that. that is, these people mm -hmm. don't want, didn't know what to do with the free time. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So How the refugee organize? camps is actually yes. The refugee camps is very interesting subject as we are talking about some some modern system. How the ref, how let's say the modern system of the settlement people in the time of the. A temporary settlement for a people in the time of the war and this Hobsburg example is very special so that's why I am investigating this uh, uh, project uh, dedicated to the refugee camps only so we have to remember that firstly those refugee camps were organized in 1914 were organized in a rush so it means very in the temporary uh, which had very temporary character so it means also that the Austrian authorities, when they started to organize this structure, they had no idea how long 
the war will be lasted. So it means that refugee camps were organized like some temporary housing for a couple of months, at least for the half year. But as a matter of fact, some of them served as a refugee shelter for a couple of years. And also with the new waves of refugees from the 1915, especially from the Italian front, we could see some uh, new structure of the refugee camps. And those new structure means that the, the Austrian authority, uh, after the reflection of organizing the refugee camps, for example, in Czech or Moravia region, they were sure that that will be not only some form of the temporary housing, that will be some form of the something which will be lasted for, for example, one, two, or even three years, or even more. So this structure was, uh, even if we just compare the different projects of the refugee camps, the plans of the refugee camps, we could see that those constructed in 1916 were quite different than those which were constructed in the 1940-1950. But I could find some common elements connected with this, let's say, special, uh, special area uh, of the refugee camps. So firstly, we could see church, like a Greek Catholic church, Roman Catholic Church or Jewish Temple as one of the main objects in the refugee camps. Then we have also a school, then we have also a different barracks, uh, uh, then we have different uh, uh, housing area. Uh, then we could see also some special, uh, let's say, facilities connected with, for example, with bakery, with kitchen, with, uh, with even with the hospitals and so on and so forth. So it seems to be that this structure was uh, quite well organized. But as I emphasize this, especially when we are talking about those refugee camps constructed uh, after 1950 or 1916. And as you mentioned, really, the, uh, in the refugee camps, there were a lot of problems. Were these people, al were these people allowed to, to, to leave a camp just to uh, look for the work or to, to buy something in the shops mm -hmm. in the neighbor mm -hmm. uh, town? Mm -hmm. Or were they just so, completely uh, close? Mm -hmm. What was the practice? Uh, refugee camps, oh, yes, uh, refugee camps were, uh, as we know from some reports provided by the refugees and the, uh, how the refugees, some of the refugees from Galicia were treated in refugee camps. We know that some of them were, most of them, especially in 1914, 1915, were closed. So it means that was very, uh, that was a uh, very visible limitation of the movement of the society. So it means that people could not just uh, went out from their, by their own from the refugee camps. But as a matter of fact, we have to remember that that was, uh, uh, that was one of the also form of the controlling the society, which I mentioned talking about the yeah. policy. Uh, Austrian policy towards refugees in the time of the First World War. There were a lot of and maybe problems. Another, so first... maybe, sorry, maybe another. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it was also maybe it was also um, a way to to avoid uh, ethnic clashings uh, or, or conflicts between the inhabitants mm -hmm. of the camps and and the local populations. Precisely. Also, just to let's say to separate them, because uh, as we know, uh, in the especially in the 1916, 1930, with which we have very visible situation, which is which I am describing as some let's say entanglement in the crisis by three mm -hmm. different let's say points. One point was connected with the refugees who blamed local authorities or authorities as a general that they are not taking care for the refugees. Then we have also in another points, we have the local inhabitants who firstly blamed refugees that they are competitors in everyday life. And inhabitants also blamed local authorities that they are not taking care of them, but they are taking uh, care of refugees. So it means that the society was totally entangled in a crisis. So that was also one of the form of the policy just to separate refugees from the locals. Of course, this is what we, this, that was something which they were able to do in the refugee camps. It was a problem beyond the refugee camps because refugees were almost everywhere in all of the cronlands of the Habsburg monarchy at that time. And they were, vis they were visible in the public spaces. They were visible among local inhabitants, even that they lived in their own clusters. So it means they lived mostly together as refugees. And some, uh, let's say, uh, let's say that integration between refugees and locals was maybe visible, but on, only in some, uh, some, some, uh, let's say, examples. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, every every war, even the uh, the long one, 
uh, finish at, at 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 one moment. So when did the returns of the refugees started to uh, to to, to uh, Galicia? Did everyone mm-hmm. uh, want to return as soon as uh, as possible uh, to their homeland? Uh, how looks Galicia after being free from the Russian uh, occupation? What's the scale of the vast, of the war devas, uh, devastation? That, that, that's mm-hmm. I'm wondering mm-hmm. if you can share some. Mm-hmm. Uh, result of your mm-hmm. research on that topic. Yeah, so we have to remember that situation in Galicia uh, changed together with the military operation from the Gorlice Tavlo from May 1915. And this provided some situ- special, let's say, circumstances that uh, that some part, that western part of Galicia were, uh, became free from Russian occupation. Then as a, after, as a consequence of the Golisa Tarnov campaign, uh, city of Przemysl, so Fortress Przemysl, was also free of Russian invaders. And the same happened in, at the beginning of, uh, the, the same happened also in June 1915 with the capital, with Lemberg, with Lviv. And this provided uh, some possibilities to f- uh, returning from. Uh, refugee camps or just from the refugee to Galicia by uh, by those refugees. But, uh, but as a matter of fact, the problem was that Galicia was totally destroyed country, totally destroyed Kronland, and as a ma- and as in the realities, their home site were also totally destroyed by the military warfare. And this this caused a situation that even if they could have this possibility, because the Galicia was free of um, even that they have this possibility to go back to their home site, the problem was that the Galicia was totally destroyed, their home site was totally destroyed. And that's why the, also a new policy was introduced by the Austrian government, Austrian Ministry of Interior, that Galicia was divided into three different sectors, sectors A, sector B, sector C. It means that the, the counties in Galicia were connected with those sectors. It means that Sector A means that, refu- that this territory was free for return for refugees. Sector B and Sector C was uh, uh, that was unable to return uh, returning home by refugees because of the in the case of Sector B military uh, because of the total destruction and devastation of the territories and in the Sector C because uh, st- because of still lasting military warfare, especially in the eastern part of the Galicia. We have to remember that after the uh, after that, after 1915, we still have the military operations. 1916, which we mentioned that about the waves of refugees, 1916, we have we have Brazil of offensive uh, in June, uh, July 1916. And then in the last one, Kerensky's offensive in autumn 1917. And after that, we have the situ and after that after the revolutionary in russia Rush, uh, the, the galicia as generally speaking the eastern fro- uh, the, the galicia and also another part of the polish lands became uh, uh, f- became a free but still totally devastated and we have to remember that also that some of refugees who uh, decided to go back to galicia they found their home totally distracted their, let's say, prior to the First World War I life were also totally distracted. So they decided to go back once again to Vienna, to Prague, to some other cities in the western part of the Habsburg monarchy, just to start their life once again. And then 1918 appeared and the, it's, let's say, complicated the situation together with the collapse of the Habsburg monarchy. Mm-hmm. But coming back uh, for, for for a short time to, to 1915, 1916, uh, were the Austrian authorities interested in uh, returning of refugee to the, the home provinces, or if so, so um, did they force uh, Galician just to 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 leave uh, to left uh, to leave uh, uh, these camps and and move to the Galicia or or? conducted any any policy of encar- encouraging Galician just to to came back to Galicia and to rebuild the the normal life you know? there is no doubt that refugees really wanted to go back to their home site they just missed their life before the war 
Uh, they found themselves very uncomfortable in the refugee states or just beyond the refugee camps. So even the Austrian authorities provided the list of the uh, uh, of the counties in Galicia which were free of Russian invaders or of which were free for return for them. As a matter of fact, they really wanted to go as soon as uh, they, they really wanted to go back as soon as possible. So the problem was with the Austrian bureaucracy, as usual in the time of the First World War and also before the First World War, because they need to fulfill a lot of documents. They need to provide some. They need to receive some passports, some special documents. We have to remember this is still even after the summer 1915. This is the state of war. This is some special situation within the Habsburg, uh, Habsburg monarchy. This is Ausnahmezustand. So it means it means in the reality it means they were very strict, controlled by this. Uh, the, the, the control was very strict. Also, we have to remember that the only possible way back to Galicia was by railways, and railways also was reserved in the first and the first place for the military purposes, then in the second, uh, and then in the second place for the civilian movement within Galicia. So they need to fulfill a lot of documents. They need to re receive a lot of the some permissions to go back to Galicia. And we have to remember that among refugees were also people who were unable to do this by themselves. So this is also quite important role of the politicians, Polish politicians, routine and Ukrainian politicians who were deputies in the House of Parliament on Vienna, reactivated after the May 1917, just to provide, just to help them, help them to even to firstly gave them information about the possibilities of returning home. So I think that uh, uh, I think that the problem was with a lot of some duties with refugee need to uh, really uh, fulfill. But I must say one example, which is also one of the which is one of the best description of the story. If the refugee really wanted to, if, if how the refugee really wanted to go back to their home site. So even in as we know from the reports provided to the uh, govern, government in Galicia, refugees wanted to uh, refu if refugees uh, just escaped from the refugee camps. Refugees stayed in sometimes in the Ill quite often in the illegal way just to be, for example, just to organize some temporary housing in the ruins in Galicia, not to being anymore in the refugee camps or not to living anymore in the mm -hmm. uh, in the let's say territories which seems to be the territories of their own country but this is the question if they really felt some sense of belonging to this country mm -hmm. if they were really the, the if they felt really the if they really were stranger in their own country mm -hmm. or if their country were more connected with this let's say the local uh, local space from the time before the first world war so I doubt that, but um, um, you mentioned about this uh, devastation of the many villages and towns in, in Galicia. Uh, did the refugee who were uh, willing to come back receive any financial support to, to rebuild the houses, just to, to, to have money, just to, to, to buy a food? This is quite interesting and also complicated question, which uh, opens us a uh, new, uh, let's say, waves of the refugees. We have to remember that after 1916, 1917, we have also internal uh, wave of the refugees. So it means that refugees from the western part of uh, from eastern part of Galicia found themselves in the western part. Also, those yeah. refugees who returned from the internal part of the Habsburg monarchy wanted to go back to their home site in the central part of the Galicia, because of the central part of the Galicia was totally destroyed, they need to stay in the western part, where also some temporary refugee houses and refugee camps were uh, organized. There were possibilities for them to receive some support from the Austrian state, but as a reality, that was also a lot of formalities to fulfill. Uh, mm -hmm. For the reconstruction, the home site, some special agencies was organized, which was the Central La Gospodarcia Odbudowy Galicji, some central agency for the for the economic restoration of Galicia, and that was the some special institution uh, which was one of the ag ag agenda of the government the gover government in Galicia to restore the home site, to restore the economical life 
uh, but that was more administrative issue than individual issue of the uh, everything the refugees. A refugees for sure could receive the social benefit being on the refugee even within Galicia. But the problem was that sometimes they were going back from the western part of the monarchy to Galicia in a hurry, sometimes missing documents, and sometimes that was also the problem to justify or just to prove that they were on the western part of the monarchy on the refugee. They were refugees, so that was sometimes very problematic to prove that they still have a status of refugees. So there is a lot of, mm -hmm. let's say, very individual stories, which very complicated individual stories, which provided us also the description of the wartime house, which appeared mm -hmm. in the, uh, in, as generally speaking, the whole time of the First World War. So how many people decided to stay uh, in the temporary um, shelters, internal provinces uh, of Habsburg monarchy after the war? Could we deliver any, any numbers? Because I, mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine that there were some people who just decided to, to, to start a new life in Austria and Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. Was it this group small or big? Do you, do you, do you know something about it? Yeah, did I feel, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, actually, there is one. There is one chapter in my book uh, about the numbers. But okay. when it comes, generally speaking, to the situation, yeah. we have to remember that uh, in the time of the after the First World War, after the collapse of the empires, some of refugees stayed in the Czechoslovakia or uh, Republic of Austria, uh, Republic of Austria or Czechoslovakia after the 1918, uh, and they need to justify why they wanted to receive a new citizenship and i my uh, i would like to provide and i will provide some example of the jewish um, refugees from galicia who wrote a special letter to uh, who wrote a special um, request who wrote, who wrote a special request to the ministry of interior on Czechoslovakia just to just in order to justify and prove why they wanted to stay in the Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And some of them wrote that after the 1918, mm -hmm. the Galicia is not existing anymore. They were Galicianers. Their life were connected with the Galicia, not with the Poland. Poland is something very, let's say, uncommon for them. So that's why they decided that they wanted to fall more comfortable in the mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia or in Austria, for example, and some of them really stayed, uh, stayed there as a refugees. But this is actually a new, and uh, this is actually another story because, uh, especially in the case of the Czechoslovakia, there was a lot of the that were, there were some situations when refugees after 1919-1920 were just forced, expelled to the Polish, to the freshly establishing the second republic of fresh establishing the second republic of poland so this is let's say some new story uh, or let's say this continue maybe not new story this is some continuation of this story what happened with refugees after the mm -hmm. 1918 maybe it's hard to say some precise numbers uh, maybe it's hard to, to, to provide some yeah i don't expect that i know it's, it's just impossible <laughs> to to to, to, to give uh, uh, details, but uh, what 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 uh, the refugee uh, concerns. Um, this summer, I spent my, my holiday in Austria and in Italy, and during my visit in Graz, I tried to localize Osarium, so a, a memory place of the victims of this Tallerhof uh, camp. Uh, did you meet during your your trips to the former camps or, or the places where the refugees from Galicia were forced to, to live any any visual tra material traces of of, of mm -hmm. their of the being are there any I don't know building churches or any mm -hmm. material signs of, of these dramatic experiences from the First World War? Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely, we, even that refugee camps, refugee states after the First World War, let's say, were uh, used in some other purposes. It depends on the history of the refugee camps. Some of them, they were just like the uh, new housing for the society, for the inhabitants after the First World War. Some of the refugee camps were just demolished and the material were like a wooden material were used for some other purposes. But we have to remember that, for example, uh, 
some of the real legacy are still visible in the space of the Austria, nowadays Austria, uh, Czech Republic, or uh, Austria or Czech Republic. So you mentioned it about the Talelhof and Osuarium. So Osuari in Talelhof. So this is one of the legacies after the not refugee the refugee camp, but the camps for the uh, in, uh, inter, uh, internment camps from the time of the First World War, dedicated to the Ruthenians from Galicia. But also the case, for example, of Holabrun or, for example, Gmund. So those two cities in Lower Austria where the refugee mm -hmm. camps were located, we could see that some of the infrastructure is still in use or visible in the uh, in the uh, space of those two cities. In the case, for example, of some other some uh, of some other places, we could see some examples of the refugee of the cemeteries where the refugees were buried. Like for example, we in in, in Czech Republic in the Havlíčkův Brod, we have a Jewish cemetery which were uh, which was actually the cemetery where the refugees from the refugee camps from Bukovina and Galicia were buried there. Uh, sometimes we could see also the topographical names after the refugee camps. So example from uh, Carinthia, uh, where uh, the refugee camps in Wolfsburg uh, was organized. So we have Rutenenweg, so the, let's say the streets of the Ruthenian streets because of the uh, play, uh, which was let, which is actually the street, which was the main street in the refugee camp where the Ruthenians from Galicia were located. So such of the legacies could we, we could see such of the legacies in the, uh, in the some particular cases. We could see also some other uh, elements, like for example, monuments. So uh, in the Gmund where one of the biggest one refugee camps was constructed in the time of the First World War, we could see a Flutingsdenkmal, so the refugee monument which was established there after the Second World War. On the same case, for example, we could see on the cemetery in Grudik where also refugee camps together with the prisoner of war camps was organized. Thank you very much, Kamil, for your discussion. I would like only to mention that Kamil was um, honored by a special uh, historian prize in Krakow, which we which he received in a couple of days. So congratulations for your book. And as I mentioned at the beginning of our our, our um, uh, talk, uh, I, I hope that we can uh, read your book soon in uh, one of the conference languages. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the discussion. Bye. Thank you.